change he makes, that others would see my life and know that God makes no mistakes. And when someday in heaven above I see his dear face, may I then be counted faithful as a runner in this race. Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, if you would please. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 for the scripture reading this morning. We are going to read verses 45 through 49 of Luke chapter 6. And we read the verses responsively, meaning we've been together on verse 45, then I read 46, together again on 47, alternating till we end together on verse 49 of Luke chapter 6. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. <clears throat> let's begin together on verse 45 of Luke chapter 6. Ready? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. I want to thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have copies of your word this morning. Lord, we thank you for today that we can open it up and look at thy word together, and I pray the word of God would do its work in each of our hearts. Father, I'm asking you that you would help each of us to be prepared to give you our undivided attention. I ask your blessing now as the specialist song, and that we would listen carefully, and that it would prepare our hearts to be ready to receive your word this morning. I would ask you that each of our hearts would become good soil that the Word of God could fall into and bring forth fruit. So help us today to listen carefully to what you would want to say to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame that wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face I rest on his unchanging 
changing grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor hold within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer now as we open up your word. Lord, we're thankful again for the Bible and for having copies of your word in our hands this morning. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that once again you would use your word in each one of our lives. We believe the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, I pray that this morning through your word you'd minister to each of our hearts today. Again, thank you for each one who's come. I pray, Lord, that you would walk up and down the aisle and in and out of each row and minister to each occupied seat. Give us what we need today. Help me as I bring the lesson and help the people as they listen. May your will be accomplished in this next few minutes that we spend together. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> In 1174, the Italian architect Bonanno, Bonanno Pisano, that's a good Italian for you, isn't it? He began working on what would become his most famous project, a separately standing bell tower for the cathedral of the city of Pisa. The tower would be eight stories and 185 feet tall. There was just one little problem that the builders quickly discovered. The soil was much softer than they anticipated and the foundation was far too shallow to adequately hold the structure. And sure enough, before long, the whole tower began to tilt. It continued to tilt until architects finally decided there's nothing that could be done to make the leaning tower of Pisa straight again. On December, in December of 2001, they, they tried a $25 million renovation project trying to stabilize the tower. They removed 110 tons of dirt they reduced the lean by 16 inches. But because the tower had been leaning further and further away from vertical for hundreds of years, the top of the tower was 17 feet further south than the bottom. And they believe that one day, it will collapse. What was the problem? Bad design? No. Poor workmanship? No. Inferior grade of marble? No. The problem was underneath. They, the sandy soil was unable to hold a structure of that size. The tower wasn't built upon 
a rock. It did not have a solid foundation. Well, in the <clears throat> statement that Jesus gave here in Luke chapter 6, we're talked about two men, each of them builders. And uh, they're going to build a house. And they're constructing their house. Now, the Lord Jesus, it's important you understand, He's not talking about literal houses here. He's talking about lives. Two men that decide to build a life. One builds it on a rock, Jesus said. He laid the foundation, verse 48, on a rock. If you notice in verse 49, the other man without a foundation, build a house upon the what church? Earth. In Matthew, he says it's sand. Shifting sand. Everything looks the same. They both look good. But something happens. A storm comes up. And the storm is quite fierce. In fact, the rain increases the flood level. The winds are pretty ferocious. And the, I think, I think, think you've got to remember this. Remember, we're not talking about houses. We're talking about lives. And God is saying, you're, if you're going to live your life, you will face some storms. You are going to face some difficult things in your life. You're going to, fa you're going to face some adverse winds blowing your direction. You're going to have times where the flood waters come up. No one will escape that. Whether you're building your life on the right foundation this morning or you're not building it on any foundation, you both will face the storms of life. You, nobody escapes. One builds on the rock, the other builds on the earth or on the sand. And of course, we know that when the storms came, one of the houses came crashing down and the other one stood firm because it was on the rock. How many of you are thinking of a Sunday school song right about now? The wise man built his... Tanya was going to sing that for a special today, but we kind of overruled that. You'd had you had all these people out here. And came down. But you notice who the Lord said, uh, the man who built his house upon the rock is called a wise man. And the one who built his house on the earth with no foundation is called a foolish man. A wise man and a foolish man. They both build houses. They both encounter storms. But they have two different outlooks because they have two different foundations. And they experience two different outcomes. One house stands, the other one falls apart. It's not the houses that make the difference. It's not the storms that make the difference. It's the foundation that makes the difference. Now notice... It is not just having the foundation. We know this, that the foundation of a life is Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11, and we'll look at this verse in a few minutes, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's the foundation of life. He's the rock upon which we build our life. But it's not only just having said, well, I'm, I'm saved, that's all that matters. Oh no, it's, it's more than that matters. You see, notice what Jesus said. He didn't say that the man who has him as a foundation is safe. Notice what He said, verse 47. Whosoever cometh to Me and heareth My sayings, and, what's the next two words, church? Doeth them. You're not just hearing them. Not just having Jesus as My Savior but hearing His commands and doing them. Obeying what He says. 
obeying what He tells me to do. The wise person hears the truth and obeys the truth and therefore will weather the storms of life. Will weather whatever comes at him. The quality of the relationship has to do with obedience. Obeying His Word. Don't get the idea, and sometimes in this day and age we kind of get the idea we can do our own thing, do whatever we want to do, live any way we want to live, and we're still, me and Jesus, we're good. We're okay. You're not going to ignore what Jesus has said and have a close relationship with Him. If you think that's possible, try that with your boss next week at work. Ignore what He says and see how close your relationship is. Try that with your wife, fellas. Ignore everything she says and see how close your relationship is. A guy sent me a little funny this week. It said, one guy talked to another guy said, do you, do you play any dangerous sports? The other fellow replied, yeah, sometimes I disagree with my wife. That's a dangerous sport. Ignore your friend's suggestions all the time. See how long the relationship lasts. See, we don't, we don't practice that in any other relationship. But it seems like people think, you know, I can just do whatever I want to do and me and Jesus, we're good. I can tell that's popular. It's real quiet in here. I can ignore His directions. I can ignore His commands. I can ignore things that He says I ought to do, but I'm still good with Him. In fact, there's some who think that Jesus has no right to tell them how to live or no right to tell them what to do. But that's not Bible. That's not what the New Testament teaches. That's why Jesus prefaced this whole Story of the wise man and the foolish man with verse number 46. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Why do you, why do you want to call me the Lord, and which means master, and yet you don't do what I say? If you would not be able to call your employer employer if you refuse to do the things that they say. You could not, you would not be able to do that. You would be called unemployed. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. In Matthew 12, would you look there with me, please? Matthew chapter 12. Just go back to your left a couple books to the first book of the New Testament. Matthew 12. Jesus made an interesting statement here. He made lots of interesting statements, but here's one of them. Matthew 12. <clears throat> Notice with me verse number 46. Matthew 12, verse 46. While he had talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said to him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. Well, what does that mean? Well, verse 50 tells you. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. So don't, don't exalt these people because, uh, you know, that's my mother or they were my half brothers or sisters. He's saying, Listen. Whoever, notice he didn't say, whosoever will hear the will of my Father. He said, whosoever will do the will of my Father is the same as my mother and my brother. In John chapter 15, look at John 15 with me, will you? Turn to your right, go past Luke to the next book of John. John chapter 15. Again, things that Jesus spoke about obedience. 
about doing what He commands us to do. John 15, notice with me verse number 10. Jesus said, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment, and abide in His love. Look at verse 14. Ye are my friends, if ye do most of what I command you. I'm sorry. You are my friends if you do some of what I command you. No, you are my friends if you do what? Whatsoever I command you. Anything and everything that I command you. Go to your left in John, John chapter 14. John 14. Notice verse 22. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If a man love me, what will he do, church? He'll keep my words. And my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with Him. So Jesus said, if a man loves Him, he'll obey Him. Am I right? Is that what He said? Okay. What did He say in verse 24? He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So, Jesus is saying, okay, those who don't love me, how will you know they don't love me? They won't do what I say. They won't follow my commandments. Boy, He makes it real simple, doesn't He? Doesn't He break it down real good? What, what you don't see is there, there might have been somebody there and saying, now don't judge me. Imagine telling that to Jesus. Look at 1 John. Go all the way back to your, towards the back of the Bible. The last book in the Bible is Revelation. Right before that is Jude. And then there's 3 John, 2 John, and then 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Look with me at verse number 3. Here's, a, here's one of the birthmarks of a believer, so to speak, if you know that you've been born again. Notice what John says here in verse 3 of chapter 2. Hereby we do know that we know Him. How can I know that I know Christ if we keep His commandments? Now, he that saith, circle that word, saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments. What's the next three words, church? Wow. John, you're a little rough, aren't you? The truth is not in Him. Wait a minute. Is the truth something? Is the truth someone? Who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? Who said that? Jesus. So he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth, Jesus, is not in him. Wow, that's rough. John, you're the disciple of love. What's happened to you? And John isn't writing his words, you understand. He's writing what the Holy Spirit told him to write. All I think you have to look at this morning is if, if the... I'm not saying that you don't ever not serve God or you don't ever not keep a commandment or not fulfill His sayings because we all sin and come short of the glory of God. But the over, if the drive and the passion of your heart is not to obey God and do what God wants, 
then you're deceiving yourself. It's not what you say, but it's how you live. It's a disregard of what God wants you to do. A disregard of what God says in His Word. Uh, you're in First John. Keep coming to your left and go past Peter and James and go to the book of Hebrews chapter 2, please. Hebrews chapter 2. Are you alright? Everybody okay? Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> Therefore, verse 1, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard it? God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. God is saying if, listen, if people are judged, and they will be, who obey not the Gospel. And by the way, God is, I just read it again this week. Somebody said if you don't accept Christ as your Savior, God doesn't send you to hell, you send yourself. But the truth is, and I understand they're, they're thinking on that, but the truth, that's like saying, you, know, you, you, you rob a bank and you go to court and you plead guilty, the judge isn't sentencing you to jail, you're sentencing yourself. Yeah, try telling the judge that. Tell the judge, no, no need to pronounce sentence, I'll do it myself. It doesn't work that way. God is the judge and God is the righteous judge. And He will rightfully... Cast those who reject His Son. He'll rightfully send them to hell. And He's right to do so. And He's just to do so. But don't think that if I say, well, I say I have Jesus, but I ignore Him, I ignore His commands, I ignore what He tells me to do, don't think you'll escape. You'll be under His judgment as well. Isn't this an uplifting message? The wise man. Go back to Luke chapter 6 with me, will you? The wise man builds his house on the solid foundation. I'll make this statement to you. The wise man's house still stands after the storm. Again, wise because he heard the teachings of Jesus and he obeyed the teachings of Jesus. How do we hear his teaching? How do we hear the teaching of Jesus today? Well, we hear it through preaching. We hear it through Bible study. You ought to, you ought to have it through your own Bible reading. Your own time of spending time with God. Sunday school. Radio. Evangelists. Missionaries. There's various means that, that God gives us to be able to hear His Word. And hear His instructions. But what makes a strong foundation is not hearing it, but doing it after we hear it. Putting faith into action. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. What's the rest of that say? Deceiving your own selves. So if the Bible teaches us to give the Lord a tithe, we tithe. If the Bible says that we're to pray, we pray. The word says we're to love others. We love others. If the Word says we, we were to tell the Gospel, then we go tell the Gospel. 
If the Word says we're not to lie and cheat or gossip or covet or steal or lust or hate, then we don't do those things. We're obeying the Word. We don't merely hear what to do. We do what we're supposed to do. The wise man builds his house on the rock. And that's the foundation that won't fail when the storm comes. When the trials and tribulations beat against our life. Our life doesn't come crashing down because Jesus Christ is the foundation and we continue to do what He's told us to do. How many times do people stop doing what Jesus told them to do when the storms come? Don't do that. We build that way because we value the foundation. Now I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians 3, okay? 1 Corinthians 3. This is speaking now of a judgment that Christians will be at. There's a judgment of those who know Christ as their Savior, and there's a judgment for those who do not know Christ as their Savior. Those who do not know Christ as their Savior, that's called the Great White Throne Judgment. It's found in Revelation chapter 20, and it's called that because Jesus sits on a white throne. We are not at that judgment to be judged. We are, in, we are at the, what's called here the judgment seat of Christ. That's where those of us who are saved will stand to give an account for how we built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. How we build a life on Him. Notice what the Bible says. Verse number 11. For other foundation no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it will be revealed, how church? By fire. The fire shall try every man's work of how much it is. No, it doesn't say that, does it? Of what sort it is. This is not about quantity, this is about quality. What sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, God says, we're going to see how you built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, He becomes your foundation. Now, we all build on that. And there's materials here that God says you use to build with. It's gold, silver, and precious stones, or it's wood, hay, and stubble. Now again, how are these materials going to be tested? By what? By fire. Okay, if they're tested by fire, do you think I'd like to have gold, silver, and precious stones, or would I like to have wood, hay, and stubble? I think I want some gold, silver, and precious stones. If I'm building a fire in my fireplace in January, I want wood, hay, and stubble. Throw it in there. That'll burn good. But not at the judgment. Can I tell you something? Whether you use wood, hay, or stubble, or whether you use gold, silver, or precious stones depends on how much value you place in the foundation. If I value the foundation of Jesus Christ, I want to build gold, silver, and precious stones. Because I value that foundation. The wise man builds upon the rock. Let me come look at your house. I'll tell you how much you value your house.
If I come and take a look inside your vehicle today, I can tell you how much you value your vehicle. If there's garbage across the floor and you can't even get your feet to hit the floor, you don't value your vehicle very much. You go to some people's house and it's, it's a mess and it's not kept up. and it, Well, it's a rental. Can I help you with something? It doesn't matter if it's a rental home to you or not. It's the house God has given to you and you are to be a good steward of what God gives to you. It's good preaching right there. The things that God gives to us, the possessions we have, how we care for them shows the value we place in them. And how we build on the foundation of Jesus Christ shows the value that we place in Him. Bible reading, prayer, witnessing, being holy unto God, separate from the world, faithful to church, loving God's people, giving to God's work, helping the poor. You know what? That's, that's showing Jesus, that's building with gold, silver, and precious stone. Showing Him. That's, that's laying up treasure in heaven. When it's the things of the world, possessions, money, entertainment, pleasure, when those are the materials that build our life, it's wood, hay, and stubble, my friend. It'll burn up. Can I help you with something? Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Who is to be your foundation? Jesus Christ. The foundation is the rock. When you're building this high rise, they go down. Sometimes they go further down than the building goes up. Why? They're trying to find rock, bedrock that can hold that building and steady that building no matter what storms beat around it. And the only sure rock you and I have as believers is Jesus Christ. Don't, listen, let me help you. Don't get mad at me. Some of you already are, but try and not get unmad. Don't, I, I, I cringe when people say, my wife's my rock. Are my husband's my rock? You're in trouble. Because it, listen, no human, are you saying that you'd rather rely on them than Jesus Christ? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. Wife, husband, Dad, mom, uncle, aunt, brother, sister, the sweetest name, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I just help you and save you some heartache. Make Christ your foundation. He's the only one you're going to build a life on. Everything else is going to sink. Everything else is going to fail. You'll fall apart when the storms come. In fact, back in Luke chapter 6, it says, notice when the house fell down of the foolish man, the ruin of that house was great. What a mess it was. The foolish man will fail during the storm. And again, what, hey, church, what separated the wise man from the foolish man? They both heard, but the wise man did. He obeyed. The foolish man just heard. They both heard, but the foolish man never did what he heard. 
You say, well, I don't... Hey, preacher, I've been coming to church. My mom and dad brought me up in church and I've been coming to church and I'm not doing what God says and I'm doing okay so far. So far. But you haven't been around as long as I've been around. In, in 36 years almost of pastoring churches, I've seen the ruin. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And it's always sad. It's always tragic. It's not enough to hear Christ's teaching and understand them. It's not enough to hear the teaching and remember them. It's not enough to hear the teaching and recite them to others. You have to do them. You have to obey. Don't put your hope in the things of the world. Whether it's prosperity, whether it's possessions, whether it's position, maybe it's religion. Don't don't trust in religion. A lot of people want to do that. Well, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a good person. Well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I mean, I, I got baptized. I was christened. I go to church. I say my prayers. I don't try to hurt anybody intentionally. It's sand. All other ground is sinking sand. It doesn't stand. When the storms come, and they'll come, and the adversities of life come, and they come, It'll reveal what your foundation is. In Matthew, when Jesus told this story, it's in Matthew 7, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to give you a statement that the people made. When Jesus finished saying this, Luke didn't include it, but Matthew did. It says, the people, when they heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. You know, is they were amazed at what he said. It's possible to admire good teaching and preaching, and yet never do it, never obey it, remain in ignorance, to be impressed but be unchanged. To be a hearer, but never a doer of the Word of God. When the storm comes, will your life, will it be revealed that your life was built on the rock, Christ Jesus? Or will it be revealed that it was built on sand? you have a piece of paper? If you have a piece of paper, I want you to write something down. If not, you can do it later, but you probably won't remember it. If you have a piece of paper, no matter how small, how big, just four columns, divided into four columns. In the first column, I want you to write, God said. God said. The second column, I want you to write, I will. In the third column, I want you to write, I did. And in the fourth column, write the words, God blessed. God said, I will, I did. God blessed. In your Bible somewhere on a piece of paper, if you're honest and you really will do this, you ought to write this down. Every day, I will practice three things. I will humbly come. I will conscientiously listen 
or consciously listen. And number three, I will intentionally obey. I will humbly come, consciously listen, and intentionally obey. Not long ago, I saw somebody's Bible, I don't remember whose it was, and they had a little saying in the front of their Bible. The saying said, this book will keep you from sin, our sin will keep you from this book. Heard that? Not, not entirely true. We have people come, we have people in the prison, Brother Bob. We have people in prison who've been on their fifth number and seventh number. You quote scripture, they'll quote it right with you. They know it. They can quote more script, scripture as well as we can. And they're on their fifth prison number. No, 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 listen. Obeying the book will keep you from sin. Our disobedience to the book will keep you from the book. Are you obeying? I'll close with this. David, and I want to say Sevilla, I'm not sure if that's pronounced right, the last name is Flood, went with a two-year-old son from Sweden to the heart of Africa, 1921. They met up with another couple named Ericsson's and the four of them sought God's direction and left the mission station and entered into a remote area. The chief of the village would not let them enter so they built mud huts a half mile away on, an, on the slope of a nearby hill. They prayed for a spiritual breakthrough. Their only contact with the village was a young boy who was allowed to sell them chickens and eggs twice a week. Savea Flood, who was four feet eight inches tall, decided that if this was the only African she could talk to, she would give the gospel to the young boy, and eventually she succeeded in leading him to Christ. No other breakthroughs came, however, and malaria began to strike them. The Ericsons decided to leave, and soon Savea became pregnant and gave birth in a state weakened by malaria. Seventeen days later, she died. David Flood, her husband, snapped inside. He dug a grave and buried his 27-year-old wife, walked down the mountain to the mission station, gave his newborn son to the Ericsons, and said, I'm going back to Sweden. God has ruined my life. Eight months later, the Ericsons were stricken with sickness and died within days of each other. The, ba the baby was turned over to the American missionaries who called her Aggie and brought her to the U.S. at age three. They stayed in the U.S. and pastored in South Dakota. Aggie grew up. She attended Bible college and married a man named Dewey Hurst. Together they entered the ministry and Dewey became president of a Christian college in Seattle. A Swedish religious magazine appeared in their mailbox one day. Aggie could not read the words, but turned through looking at the pictures. All of a sudden a photo stopped her cold. A grave with a white cross in a primitive setting. The name was Savea Flood. She hurried to the college where a faculty member translated the article for her. The story was of missionaries who came long ago. Birth of a white baby, death of a young mother. One little African boy led to Christ. The boy grew up, persuaded the chief to let him build a school in the village. And he won children to Christ. Children led parents to Christ. The chief became a Christian. And now there were 600 believers in that one village. 
attributed to the sacrifice of David and Sevilla flood. But that's not the end of the story. For their 25th wedding anniversary, they took a trip to Sweden. She was trying to find her father, David. David had went back to Sweden and remarried, had four children. He'd become an alcoholic. He had had a recent stroke, but he was still bitter at God. The family warned her about him, but she went to see him anyway. They told her he has one rule, never mention the name of God. Because God took everything from me. Eggie found in his apartment, it was littered with debris and liquor bottles. A 73-year-old man in a rumpled bed Papa, he began to cry. He said, I never meant to give you away. She said, it's okay. God took care of me. God. God forgot all of us. Our lives have been like this because of Him. And he turned his face back to the wall. That's when Aggie told him the story. Mama didn't die in vain, Papa. That little boy grew up and he won an entire village to Jesus Christ. That one seed you planted kept growing and growing. Papa, Jesus loves you. He never hated you. That afternoon, she saw her daddy, her papa, come back to God. And within weeks, he was gone into eternity. A few years after that, she was at a conference in London. A report was given from the nation of Zaire, formerly called the Belgian Congo. It was given by a representative from the National Church there representing 110,000 believers. Aggie came to the man afterwards and asked him, Have you ever heard of David and Savea Flood? Yes, ma'am. He said it was Savea Flood who led me to Jesus Christ. I was the boy who brought food to your parents. And to this day, your mother's grave and her memory are honored by us all. You must come because your mother is the most famous person in our history. And they went and they were welcomed by cheering throngs of villagers. They met a man who carried her down the mountain and escorted her to see her mother's grave. She knelt in the soil and thanked God for a life that was not wasted. A short life. But a short life lived for God brought eternal rewards. There are people who live a lot longer than Savea Flood but it's wood, hay, and stubble. She only had 27 years, but she built with gold, silver, and precious stones. Build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, whatever you're building your life on will not last. It will not bring fulfillment. Tom Brady, when he won his Super Bowl, his first Super Bowl, his comment was, is this all there is? This is it? He found out I've reached the pinnacle of my profession. I won the the highest you can get as a football player. And I got the MVP of the game, the most valuable player. Yet that emptiness in my heart is still there. You know why? Because only Jesus Christ can fill that. If you've never received Him as your Savior, receive Him today. Begin to build your life on Jesus Christ. Be a wise man. Be a wise man. Don't be foolish. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for everyone's attention today.
Lord, thank You for these plain words that You gave us in Luke and also in Matthew. How, how important it is that we build our life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I have twofold prayer to ask of You this morning. I pray in these last few moments before we depart and go our separate ways, that You would speak to any in this room who have never, ever Ask Jesus Christ to forgive their sin and to be their Savior. Oh, may they realize that they'll give an account for their sin before God one day. And either they'll accept the fact Jesus paid for their sin debt and He paid the price for their sin when He died on the cross, that Christ died for their sin, for our sins. And they'll trust what He's done for them. Receive Him as their Savior. And you'll give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Lord, I pray that they come and receive Christ as their Savior today. They wouldn't put it off. They would say, I'm going to be wise about this. I'm going to accept Christ today. And there are those in the room, Lord, who have accepted you as their Savior. but they've not been very careful about how they're building their life. They've allowed a lot of wood, hay, and stubble to go into their building. We haven't valued our foundation like we ought to and been careful that we build with gold, silver, and precious stones things that will last and stand the test of the fire at the judgment before God. Help us. that our lives we could so live that it would reflect and it would show that we value the foundation we're building.